Hello to everyone for our last uh, session. And I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Jason Bell from the University of New Brunswick, Canada. We are very happy to have uh, with us someone who has a solid expertise in Husserl and pragmatism. He will talk uh, exactly about uh, the theme, is Husserl a pragmatist? Uh, I want to recall that, that Jason taught in Belgium at Leuven University, where there is uh, the Husserl archive at Göttingen and in the United States. Now he is in Canada. He wrote uh, an important book on Josiah Royce. Uh, he edited a volume on Whitehead and, and again on Royce. Part of his current research is exactly about phenomenology and pragmatism. I think he's among the few who can, well, uh, who can very well explain this link. And actually he's preparing an issue of the uh, European Journal of Pragmatism and American Philosophy exactly on the theme of pragmatism and phenomenal, phenomenology. So we are delighted to hear him uh, today here. I want just uh, to excuse myself because uh, uh, I have to leave you uh, in about an hour when Jason uh, will finish for an unexpected meeting that I cannot miss. So I just want to say a few more words uh, at the end of our meeting. Given the interest raised by our seminars, we are considering effective ways to continue this dialogue and, uh, and we'll let you know through the mailing list whether we'll organize a new cycle of seminars uh, next year or promote a call for papers on these very topics for our um, electronic journal NOEMA or for a forthcoming book of collected essays. So everyone, anyone who is interested will be called. To all of those who attended at least 80% of these seminars, Please send us an email for your attendance certificate. A very warm bye bye to everyone. Yes, I, I have to leave you. So please, Jason. Hey. Well, thank you very much. So I let me just begin by saying how, how happy I am to be giving a talk to Milan. I'm only sad that I cannot be in Milan. Um, so all, all of these years I've been working on pragmatism and phenomenology and process philosophy, uh, and most people have, have been pretty clueless about this context, and I can, I can accept a few names. Uh, John Sturr, who's here, has known about these connections, uh, and Andreas Taiti. I've had some good talks with him about this, but for the most part, it's been a, a complete surprise to people. But when I talk to Milan, it's old hat. Everybody knows these things. And I've always been surprised. And finally, uh, yesterday, Maria Regina explained this to me. It's Enzo, Professor Enzo, Enzo Pacci and Carlo Sina, uh, who have been on to this for, for decades. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to hear this so I can, I can uh, you know, read further about this. But it's, it's really, you know, you know, objectively speaking, Milan has been so far ahead in understanding these relations than, uh, than the rest of the world. So it's really an honor to be here. Um, so I am going to uh, just really in a straightforward way be reading my paper uh, out loud. You're, you're welcome to, to follow along. I think uh, Simone said that you'd put the, the paper in the chat. Uh, is that correct? Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll just be uh, re reading this in a straightforward way. I'm going to be just skipping one paragraph towards the beginning that talks about uh, how I came to this. And, and you're welcome to, to read that on your own. Uh, so I'm going to be looking at the Percy and Husser Husserl conversations between 1890 to 1902. Uh, and the paper goes like this. So is Husserl a pragmatist? Yes, Husserl is a pragmatist. 
namely with a healthy dose of William James's pragmatism, but still larger doses of Charles Peirce's and Josiah Royce's pragmatism. I don't mean to prove the whole case at once today, but to suggest a point of comparison at the point of logic as habit. Then skipping the next paragraph. Uh, crucially for Peirce, and a point that was of tremendous importance to James Husserl and many others, was that we could harness philosophy for the improvement of habits, and habits of thinking could lead to better metaphysical understanding of the world of experience. Philosophy was not simply the gray on gray <clears throat> reflection of a past world as described by Hegel, for whom the owl of philosophy only appears at dusk, nor a fixed set of categories as for Kant. Like Aristotle, Peirce understood that habits of thinking could be good or bad in relation to the happy contemplation of the world, but that with the dedication and practice, they could get better. Philosophy, like the special sciences, helps us to, to discover the truth that we do not yet know. In the 1891 publication on Schröder, Husserl is clearly surprised by what Peirce is up to on habit. He describes the abenteuerliche theory of judgment for Peirce, wherein unglaublich aber war die Urteil als Spezialfälle von Denkgewohnheiten erklärt werden. Husserl, who is often harshly judgmental in his writing from this period, leaves the matter at this, unglaublich aber war, unbelievable but true, uh, that uh, Charles Peirce is looking at the judgment as a special case of uh, habit of thinking. Uh, for Husserl in 1891, it was too astounding to even take a position on. One might even say it was a first chance for Husserl to bracket an idea, thinking about it in itself as an ideal meaning without declaring it true or false. In Emanuele Caminata's book on habit in Husserl, von Gemeingeiz zum Habitus, he describes Husserl's focus on the ish der Konsequenz, which, quote, as a kind, is a kind of ethical commitment to consistency. It's a form of active habit. And this habit for Husserl is the backbone of reason. Husserl's self-aware turn to habit is, as Kaminata shows, made around 1913. But I would like to suggest that the influence and a Persian influence at that may have begun for Husserl much earlier before Husserl's characteristic turn to phenomenology. My discussion will focus on the period 1890 to 1902, an important period for Husserl's first turn towards phenomenology, although he did not yet identify his own position as phenomenology until after this apparently in a letter to William Hawking circa 1903, one year after Royce called attention in his presidential address to the American Psychological Association of the promising path of Husserl's phenomenology, which made logical space for pure and empirical sciences, the kind of thing a pragmatist would notice. I will first discuss Husserl's reception of Peirce and then conclude with a discussion of how we can read the opening of Husserl's 1900 to 1901 logical investigations as pragmatic. We won't cover a lot of grounds in terms of Husserl's logical investigations, but we may take solace in Aristotle's dictum that the beginning is more than half of the whole. While a rich literature explores theoretical relations between Husserl and Peirce, Husserl and Royce, Husserl and James, Husserl and Dewey, Husserl and Santayana, the full story hasn't yet been told about Peirce's early influence on Husserl. But it may have proved a crucial influence, even more important than that of James, particularly by giving Husserl access to a way beyond a bitter duel that ravaged the philosophical landscape. Could young Husserl give credit to both the absolute ideal, pure logical science of Kant and Lotze, 
and to the empirical processive elements of science as by way of Hume and Mill. Husserl wanted to do both, but at that time it seemed foolish to try, given that only one or the other, it seemed, could win the battle. So the matter was, before meeting Peirce, more a matter of lurching from one to the other. Uh, note here, for instance, the Heidelberg Philosophy Conference of 1908, when the fight between idealism and pragmatic empiricism nearly came to blows. But Peirce, with a detour around the modernist crash by way of ancient and medieval philosophy, showed a way that one could have a logic that was made of two fundamental sciences, pure and empirical, with both in turn being subservient to inquiry itself as the desire to know truth in both absolute and probabilistic domains. In this, Peirce's role may be particularly crucial, helping to show Husserl a way to take psychology seriously without succumbing to psychologism, the reduction of logic itself to empirical psychological processes. Nor did Husserl want to throw his hat in with the neo-Kantians and ignore the importance of empirical research. The third way for the phenomenologists and pragmatists, truth is an ongoing accomplishment of inquiry, but it also has its essential conditions, which are also discovered by inquiry. So 1902 was an important year for the reception of pragmatism in the world of phenomenology. That year, Josiah Royce introduced Husserl and his phenomenology to the English-speaking world in his presidential address to the APA. It was Husserl, uh, Husserl's phenomenology, Royce advertised an attractive way beyond the fight I have alluded to above between idealism and empiricism. That same year, Christine Ladd, later Christine Ladd Franklin, showed up in Göttingen to talk to Edmund Husserl about Charles Peirce and gifted him with a book, Studies in Logic, signed by Peirce, that collected articles on philosophical logic from Peirce and the Persian school at Johns Hopkins. And I should mention there is clear evidence that Husserl did read this and annotated it, et cetera. Uh, that year, 1902, William Hawking likewise showed up in Göttingen to talk to Husserl about Josiah Royce, who was heavily indebted to Peirce uh, by Royce's own admission. Uh, Husserl didn't yet have fans in the same way in Germany. The beginnings of the Munich invasion of Göttingen were still a year off. The Americans were on his case first, and in particular, the pragmatists. Husserl had, after all, praised James in his Logical Investigations, Volume 2, published the previous year in 1901. And Hawking saw many points of similarity between that book and Royce's The World and the Individual, perhaps because all of them were Perseans. Perse, like Lotze, who was also a major influence on Husserl, showed how philosophy could believe in both the logical absolute and statistical probability and didn't have to choose sides in the single-sided modern debates that reduced to either pure reason or pure feeling, but that saw each of them as teleologically oriented towards achieving true beliefs and overcoming false ones. Dermot Moran writes that Husserl was in 1905 an admirer of James. Husserl, in the Logical Investigations, Volume 2, 1901, writes in the chapter, Die Ideale Einheit der Spezies, a sincere credit to James for inspiring Husserl to overcome psychologism. Why? Husserl didn't provide citations, but James was already working at this point, uh, at this point towards his pragmatism, and its claim that truth indeed has an essence founded by the process of inquiry and verification. Essence here is my word, not James's, but for James everywhere and always, truth is doing the same thing. Uh, it is not merely a matter of individuals or heaped psychologies as a description of any mental activity, 
since truth-seeking has for James certain essential characteristics. All truth-seeking shares in common an intentionality towards soundness, setting off a verification process without which truth could not occur. For there was, even for James, before he veered off towards objectivism in a number of domains, as for instance in the varieties of religious experience, at least one essential point of absoluteness. There is no truth without a will to truth and a verification process. Truth is a special kind of making activity that eventually leads to a receiving. Uh, for instance, from James's pragmatism, quote, truth happens to an idea, it becomes true, is made true by events. Its verity is in fact an event, a process, the process namely of its verifying itself, its verification, its validity is the process of its validation. Uh, and just to go off script for a minute here, uh, uh, Hawking in showing up to talk to Husserl in Göttingen uh, really notices that similarity between Royce and Husserl. As Hawking puts it, you don't get truth without uh, capturing the truth in what, in what Hawking calls a noose of intentionality. Uh, and that's why he went to Göttingen. He saw this in the logical investigations and he had first seen it uh, in the pragmatists. But to go back to my script. Uh, for James, the absolute of truth and truth seeking was this and a few other things. Willingness to leap towards truth, etc. But other than this, James wasn't a systematizer. He didn't much like Kant and protested against eternals and absolutes without realizing that he had endorsed his own inquiry-based absolute, one that nevertheless refused to hypostatize the results of inquiry. Josiah Royce in his The Philosophy of Loyalty correctly protests, I think, against James's and the pragmatists forgetting just how much of the absolute they praised even as they condemned the absolute criticism, which is equally applicable to latter-day pragmatists like Rorty, a kind of an absolute that's always in the background but never quite uh, stated forthrightly because it's too embarrassing to believe in absolutes. Uh, that is why James can at once be a point of contact with later Husserl and yet not in all senses. Husserl, like Person Royce, admired valid logical systems to a degree that we do not find in James but all of them share in common uh, that intelligent inquiry has certain characteristics that must be fulfilled for it to be truth seeking at all. So as I have learned from my research of the Husserl Archives Lubin, Husserl read at least two articles by Peirce uh, on the algebra of logic, which was written by Peirce or published by Peirce 1880, most likely read by Husserl around 1890 to 91. Uh, and a theory of probable inference, 1883, most likely read by Husserl in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, but Husserl also read a great deal about Peirce, beginning most likely with Ernst Schröder's Vorlesungen über die Algebra, sorry about this, Der Logik, which Husserl read around 1890 to 1891, and then continuing through James Royce Hawking, etc. In this work, Schroeder is effusive in his pay, praise of Peirce. Husserl, in his review of Schroeder, remarks, as we have seen, with unadulterated amazement at Peirce's concept of logic as habit. This is the adventurous, abenteuerliche theory, unglaublich aber wahr, that Peirce is making this move. Uh, so let us pause then to consider Peirce's concept of habit. Frank Ryan writes, quote, for Peirce, the various ways we fix beliefs are illustrations of the science of logic, where logic is a habit of mind useful in drawing sound inferences. Taking a page from Scotus's habit, he notices that such habits or guiding principles are seldom noticed in tasks that are routine or familiar. It is when something goes wrong, our ship becomes lost in a storm that deliberate attention to a skill such as navigation is required." End quote. As Ryan continues, quote, in a bold stroke towards pragmatism, 
Peirce holds that reality is not some self-contained state or condition, but a function of a drift or gravitation from error toward truth, end quote. The drift is such for Ryan that Peirce is, quote, exonerated from any flirtation with absolutism, end quote. But one might quibble with the term of the exoneration. Peirce isn't flirting with absolutism, he is married to it. One just needs to be clear about the kind of absolutism he is asserting versus the kinds he is rejecting. In being scientific, we are always and everywhere, absolutely, trying to move towards truth and away from falsity, and that is perfectly absolute, even as it is folly to set up any merely partial observation of the truth as if it could never be improved or revised. For Peirce, the drift towards agreement is all the absolute that you need with anything beyond this drift, a metaphysical fiction. Larry Hickman in The Products of Pragmatism shows Peirce's relation of thought and its conditions and expressions with four citations of Peirce. First, the real and living logical conclusion is the habit, the verbal formulation merely expresses it. Action cannot be a logical interpretant because it lacks generality. Two, the concept which is a logical interpretant is only imperfectly so. It is inferior to the habit. The deliberately formed self-analyzing habit, self-analyzing because formed by the aid of analysis of the exercises that nourished it, is the living definition the veritable and final logical interpretant. Third, the whole function of thought is to produce habits of action. Four, every man exercises more or less control over himself by means of modifying his own habits. As for quotes two and four, the matter is similar to that described by Aristotle for whom, era, for, for whom habits are virtues and vices and earlier for Plato and Socrates, for whom there are good and bad habits, as described by Plato's two horses, noble and lustful. As for one, we will consider the same point in a moment as made by Husserl as pointing to a coherentism that involves action and language, but is irreducible to just these expressions. And as for the third, thinking as a kind of making or technology, uh, a point which will also, as we will see, be named by Husserl. And I should say I was reading over some of the seminar notes, and I can uh, also saw that uh, Professor Storr's talk early in the semester dealt with this aspect of creativity uh, at the end of a logical activity. Uh, the crucial thing that Hickman adds in considering these four together is that it is a serious error to reduce pragmatism to number three, as is often done without considering one, two, and four as the tests of thinking and action. For Peirce, then, the ethical upshot is clear. He doesn't use the word happiness or eudaimonia in the above quotes, but the upshot of this logical activity is graceful self-control, as James understood. The point isn't any action. The fool, too, is involved in action, but it is rather graceful action when needed and as part of a larger project of understanding. But Peirce also understood that not all habits are good habits. By the time of Husserl's The Crisis of the European Sciences in the 1930s, Husserl was similarly clear. The Greeks had established a strong habit of logical universalization. The European sickness of the 20th century was a bad habit. A universalization of mathematics as a mere fragment or a single technological manifestation of thinking, idolatrously substituted for the whole. For Husserl, everything hinged on whether consistent philosophical univer universalization won the day, a practice that wisely wanted new fellow inquirers rather than mutual enmity, and that could make place for complementary sciences, or whether the victor would be a shallow natural scientific uni universalization, one that made war against the human spirit. 
the choice wasn't to have a logical habit or not, but rather which habit would rule, one that progressively understood being or one that occluded being. And here, let me just say this just sounds a lot like Charles Peirce uh, and the notion that you know, thou shalt not block the road of inquiry. Uh, so evidence of Husserl's reading of Peirce is found at Husserl Archives KI38, nearly a decade before Husserl's original turn to phenomenology, Husserl read Peirce's Algebra of Logic. The KI manuscript likely dates from 1890 or 1891, since it is almost certainly the notes of research for Husserl's 1891 piece on Schroeder's Algebra of Logic. Schroeder makes very extensive use of Peirce's thought in his algebra. Husserl, in reviewing this book, Schroeder's book, apparently realized he would needed to get acquainted with Peirce to write an adequate review of Schroeder. So there's nothing so strange about Peirce's claim from a Platonic Aristotelian perspective. But the formulation indeed sounds strange to either modern idealism or empiricism, and that is likely why Husserl was surprised to hear it. Idealism tends, after all, to be interested in questions that are purely absolute, unpolluted by time, while the empiricist says bosh to pure absolutes. There is nothing but empirical probability. For Peirce, in How to Make Our Ideas Clear, for William James, this was the founding text of pragmatism, thought is a response of the organism to the world, beginning in the irritation of doubt and seeking rest in belief. Whether the belief or the judgment are correct or not depends on whether they actually resolve the problem and return us to our rest. This puts into pragmatic terms the classical dis distinction between seeming and being. All belief thinks that it is true, but false beliefs fail to return us to rest. In this way, the common criticism that pragmatism is obsessed with action is incorrect as Hickman also shows in the above cited article. For Peirce, the better the belief, the less action is required. And even the correct belief only tells us what to do if a problematic situation is encountered. For Peirce, as for Aristotle, one wants to virtuously solve problems with the right action, not make them worse by too much of an action or by the wrong kind of action or inaction in the face of a problem that requires action. Husserl was at first worried that intruders' purse inspired account, the judgments are replaced by subsumption relationships between classes, replacing contents with relations. The same problem might be found in the notion of logic as habit. Isn't that simply replacing soundness as the end point of inquiry with an endless process of inquiry? Whether Schroeder committed this error of reducing contents to relations, I am not prepared to say, but Peirce himself is innocent of the charge. Insofar as a good pragmatist and phenomenologist, he is simply as investigation, investigating relations in quest of judgments bracketing the realm of inquiry into that which we would like to know but do not yet know without insisting that inquiry is nothing but that bracketing. In algebra, Persis is considering a set of relations as seeking contents that aren't yet known, like Husserl's lever, as we will see in a, in a minute, but abstracting for the moment from the contents. He is speaking about inquiry that is before judgment is obtained. Circa 1890, Husserl appears to still be struggling with this idea since the beginning point is for him as the logical contents themselves without yet having his later phenomenological focus on how we got to them in the first place. And let me just you know, say here, so here Peirce is problematizing this, right? Uh, he, he's not saying that the, the judgments are nothing but this, but he's saying, well, how do we get to judgments? This is the, the move behind judgments uh, rather than trying to take judgments as the, you know, kind of the, the given and then saying, no, where do these come from? Is it pure ideal categories or is it empirical fe feelings? So back to the script. Uh, so once the contents are known, after all, it's no longer algebra. Or again, once the contents are had in the terms used by Husserl and his later logical investigations, by which point I think the Persian influence is manifest, 
It is the passing over from logic as the science of sciences to this or that specific science. The ability to separate relational claims and inquiry in process from content claims helps lead to the important discovery with Peirce at its origins. A surprising claim of Peirce in this piece in relation to the older logic is that the logical notion of all does not imply some. There can be empty universal classes. In this way, we may see once again Peirce pointing the way to the notion of a phenomenological bracketing of inquiry itself, in which meaningful essences do not imply existences, but which can imply existences, but which implies two different realms of logic, akin to Peirce's contemporary Lotz's distinction between pure and applied logic against the idealistic tendency to reduce logic to the former and empiricism to reduce to the latter. Uh, and here I would commend the audience's attention to Professor Andreas Daiti's uh, recent treatment of the three universals or generalities in Lutz's logic. Uh, in this way, logic lets us talk about essences in their own being and only sometimes in their relation to existences. The resemblance to phenomenological bracketing, a setting aside of existence without skeptically denying it, isn't, I think, accidental as I do believe that Husserl borrows from Peirce. Peirce's distinction between pure and existential mode of logic elegantly, to use Burris's word, allows us to think of logic both in its pure generality and in its application to the discovery of metaphysical being through empirical methods, but also through ideal methods of inquiry into validity, with inquiry itself being, as James credited Lotze in pragmatism, a mode of being in itself. But, per, but Peirce's influence on Husserl was, I think, a very slow burn. By the time it made itself felt, Husserl himself didn't remember where it came from. We must look to Husserl's later logical investigations, 1900 forward, and the ideas, 1913 forward, to see the truly pragmatic uptake of Husserl's reading of Peirce circa 1890. Indeed, if we look at Husserl's immediate reaction to Peirce, the matter looks rather different. And here I should also add in Husserl was reading Lotz at this time, who was making a lot of the same moves that Peirce was making, apparently, without knowing about Peirce. Uh, for instance, in a separate 1891 article that is also connected with his review of Schroeder, Husserl classes Peirce together with a group lost in a British tradition of empiricizing logic. Boole and Schroeder, who have lost the, quote, thing itself of the judgment that the German logicians Leibniz and Lambert possessed, whereas Peirce and the others were lost in the contentless formal comparisons of deductive mathematical relation. Peirce simply for Husserl had the Umfangslogik, whereas Leibniz, Lambert, and Husserl had the Inhaltslogik. Peirce, meanwhile, criticized Lambert for conflating thinking about facts with the facts themselves, which makes this seem like another chapter in the story of the battle of the psychologers, psychologizers versus the anti-psychologizers of logic, and indeed of nationalistic fights of England versus Germany in relation to national philosophies, empiricism, and idealism, respectively. But Peirce was already showing a way beyond and one that Husserl would soon need at the University of Göttingen, founded by Britain's King George II, who was likewise Duke Elector of Hanover, an institution which was friendly towards English and German philosophy and didn't see anything shameful about teaching the empiricists and Kantians side by side, the first great reconciliation of the two movements coming there through Lotze. It was probably unique in Germany in this way. Around a decade later, after this, after this initial uh, mistaken criticism of Peirce, Husserl is actually much friendlier to the empiricists in his logical investigations, even as he remains a firm opponent of reducing logic to the empirical. What Husserl needed to make this move was precisely what he got in Peirce, a logician who was completely comfortable with formal calculations and with calculating statistical or empirical probabilities, 
while also seeing how the former makes possible the latter without predetermining it. That is to say, even statistical logic and empirical logic involve certain absolute logical distinctions, you know, principle of non-contradiction or, or what have you. Uh, so Husserl's earlier reading of Peirce seems to have incorrectly subsumed Peirce to a merely empiricizing position that Peirce did not endorse and in fact opposed. In addition to the study of Peirce's algebra of logic, Husserl also owned and read Peirce's and Christine Ladd's contribution to the book Studies in Logic, written by Peirce and his students, probably acquired during Christine Ladd's visit with Husserl in 1902. This text considers how logic reconciles the fact of the process of time on the one hand and the judgment of the same, sameness on the other, and the leading and following ideas that link them. Husserl highlighted this in his text, the same as the meaning of a logical effort which precedes any attainment. It is, one might say, an echo of Socrates for whom likeness and unlikeness are inborn traits of the soul which permit learning, but which is not itself learned. The soul measures, but it forgets everything else at birth, and we can know certain absolutes about the method by which we mean to know, even as we can be deceived in the world of appearances. Lutza writes a lot about this, uh, that uh, Plato was uh, only talking about this, this uh, likeness and unlikeness. He was not positing some world of ideal absolutes that are separate from the world, but rather talking about the ways in which we know the world by likeness and un unlikeness. Uh, this complementarity of moments of logic and the refusal to reduce them to any one moment of logic distinguishes Peirce from both the then traditional modes of idealism and empiricism, but also from restless humanistic romantic pragmatisms that followed and became popularized thereafter that have sometimes seemed to reduce reality to immediate subjective problem solving and nonstop action. So if you encounter the word pragmatism in you know, journal, journalism or newspapers, this is you know, almost always what they mean. Some kind of just like we act and act and act, we're not gonna think about it too much. Uh, for Peirce, the point of good sound thinking is that it brings us to restful stops and the most graceful expenditure of mental energy. It is means to contemplative ends. I would like to suggest in the concluding pages that from an understanding of Husserl's first surprised meeting of Percy and pragmatism circa 1890 to his growing appreciation of pragmatism in the following years, we can read the opening of Husserl's phenomenological work in Logical Investigations, 1900 and 1901, in a pragmatic way. As already inspired by Percy and James, and as on the way to being inspired by Royce as well. Here we will consider the opening chapter of the investigations to see what traces of pragmatism we can find. For Husserl, the various scientific domains are magnificent, but they do not satisfy us theoretically. There remains doubts and controversies. Quote, though the sciences have grown great, they cannot satisfy us theoretically. They are as theories not crystal clear. The function of all their concepts and presuppositions is not fully intelligible. Not all of their propositions have been exactly analyzed. They are not in their entirety raised above all theoretical doubt, end quote. For Husserl, we need to have a science that is not merely empirical as a set of collected results, but rather a science that seeks for what is common in all sciences, examining, quote, whatever makes sciences into sciences. End quote, or quote, a theory of sciences, end quote. Does all science share something in common? Science itself, quote, as its name indicates, end quote, is concerned with knowing. But, quote, this does not mean that it itself consists of a sum or tissue of active knowing, end quote. It is also the essence for which there are sums and tissues. It is, to use the word from Royce, a loyalty that animates anyone who is a scientist, no matter the domain, insofar as they prefer truth to falsity and knowledge to ignorance. 
For Husserl, science exists, quote, objectively only in its literature, only in written work, has it a rich relational being limited to men and their intellectual activities, end quote. One might quibble with, with the word only, but the crucial thing is the intersubjectivity. So different, of course, from Descartes' cogito or I think. The process is, as in Royce's discussion of science, irreducible to psychology. One cannot, for instance, observe physics as a psychological process by watching a single scientist. For Husserl, as with Peirce's and Royce's community of inquiry, the cogito is complemented by what might be termed the cogitamus, the we think. What is objective is the product of a community who submits, reviews, consults, and revises, like Peirce's community of inquiry. Yet at the same time, it is contributed to by individuals and the ideal has processive fruits in time. The scientific literature for Husserl, quote, represents a set of external arrangements, which just as they arose out of the knowledge acts of many individuals can again pass over into just such acts of countless individuals in a readily understandable manner, whose exact description would require much circumlocution, end quote. Why so much circumlocution? Because the literature is constantly being revised and added to by individuals. Science is in progress, but it is not merely in progress. It seeks something quite eternal, at least ethically so, in all of its moments. Quote, science provides or should provide certain more immediate preconditions of acts of knowing, real possibilities of knowing, whose realization by the normal or suitably endowed individual is well known. Normal circumstances can be looked at on as an attainable goal of this endeavor. In this sense, therefore, science aims at knowledge, end quote. This is excellent and surely right. It anticipates the empathy of later phenomenology that demands individual perspectives, social objectivity, and their ongoing relation versus attempts to reduce to individual perspectives or the formal set alone. It is also pragmatic in its attention to aiming. In this interpretive middle, science has a phenomenological and pragmatic essence. In all its parts, no matter the disciplines, science aims at knowledge and serves those who seek it. It is glad to have an objective literature and to revise it. The data change in the journals and books, but the essential set which gathers the data remains the same as the telos of inquiry. For Husserl, we have luminous certainty, quote, that what we have distinguished is that what we have rejected is not, end quote. How does knowledge of differ from baseless opinion? For Husserl, as for Peirce, it appeals to evidence and to probability assessments. From this quote, we can distinguish the reasonable from the unreasonable, the better founded from the worst founded assumptions, options, and surmises, end quote. But for the attainment, there must first be the intention. Knowledge seeking is quite absolute in this aspect. Quote, it's being quite evident that S&P, end quote, is the ideal limit which knowledge seeks, which again, Going back to Peirce's logic, uh, the SSP, which does not yet have the content, is the algebra. Uh, or we can think again to William James, the notion that without that first initial intention to figure this out, you're never eventually going to get to the truth. Uh, so likewise, Len O'Neill notes the crucial role of evidence for Peirce. Quote, Peirce's 1883 paper, A Theory of Probable Inference, is an extraordinarily fertile and prescient discussion of the nature of empirical reasoning. At the center of his thinking in the matter is his conviction that all empirical reasoning is essentially reasoning from a sample to a population. Empirical generalization is just the special case where we infer a 100% frequency of a character of the population. Inference to a scientific theory is an inference from, in effect, a sampling of its logical consequences. 
Statistical influence can only yield a conclusion that is merely probably, never certainly true, and merely approximately, never exactly. Uh, but again, here we get the probability in relation to the 100% frequency that we would be aiming at. Uh, so here we approach, but we never get to the aim of contemplative knowledge of everything. Still, there is nearer and farther progress towards versus stultification or error. For Peirce and Husserl, then, our specific sciences are doing less than everything and more than nothing. Our participation in the whole endeavor, meanwhile, in supporting truth-seeking overall, is an ethical commitment and one that can be gratified by achievements and yet eager for still more. Each particular investigation approaches or misses here or there, but they absolutely mean to approach the truth. In the logical investigations, not even Husserl realized just how long the process would take. He seemed to think that the project was nearly wrapped up. He had thought more deeply about the pragmatic nature of phenomenology by the time he published his ideas in 1913, having spent the previous year, year seriously reading Royce, one of Peirce's most dedicated students, and came to realize the process of systematic inquiry was infinitely ongoing. Husserl continues in this teleological sense. Science is more than mere knowledge, since it also aims at, quote, systematic coherence in the theoretical sense, end quote. The systematic coherence is for Husserl focused here on the grounding. He doesn't purport to offer a grand unified theory of the physical phenomena. The empirical description of the phenomena belongs to the special sciences. Husserl's question is of the logos that binds together the scientific community in the first place. It does not seek to impose a beautiful theory on the world. Rather, it is about a quest for beholding. We are seeking what is present in things, as the seeking of inquiry is itself, quote, a means towards the great, greatest possible conquest of the realm of truth by our knowledge, end quote. It is, a knowledge, it is a conquest that isn't destructive, converting nature into use values, but appreciative and ongoing. Scientific inquiry is, for Husserl, everywhere and always the same, even as the demand for the greatest possible involves movement. It is then, quote, no disordered chaos, but is dominated and unified by law, end quote. Science demands progress, which is ascending. It must, quote, reflect the systematic connections of those truths and must use the latter as a ladder to progress and penetrate from the knowledge given to or already gained by us to ever higher regions of the realm of truth, end quote. The must is an ongoing permanent ethical demand that gives rise to particular observations and judgments and special sciences, but which is irreducible to them. And compare here Royce's chapter on loyalty, truth, and reality in the philosophy of loyalty. We only get the truth by our method of seeking, even as this remains fallible, as we must submit our truth seeking to the objective idea of agreement with actual experience, which includes but transcends our own. You cannot reduce out the uh, comparative aspect. Uh, so for Husserl, validations move beyond the quote, immediately and therefore trivially relevant, end quote, through the method. As with persons moving from the sample to the population, which is not merely immediate, but references a meant set that is not present, uh, except for the sample. So the obvious or already established is used as a quote lever for achieving what is remote and only immediately obtainable, end quote. It requires general norms, quote, and quote, inventive construction in classes of cases, end quote, for which Husserl is particularly appreciative of flair and quote, anticipatory intuition, end quote, comparable with Peirce's abduction as hypothesis generation and Royce's leading ideas. Here, the method tells us not merely what is or is known, but it tells or suggests to us what to do next. 
good habits here help to inform logic. And although Husserl's explicit turn to logic as habit occurs only in 1913, as Kaminata dates it, uh, we can already see the anticipation. Quote, the trained thinker finds proofs more readily than the untrained one, end quote. One can easily see that one can get better on both sides. More practice in the form of syllogism and more practice in organized observations will typically make a better scientist, a virtue that is at once moral and intellectual in Aristotle's senses. For Husserl, it is not mere caprice that bundles scientific observations together. Quote, connections of validations are not governed by caprice or chance, but by reason and order, i.e. by regulative laws, end quote, as with the syllogistic form. Quote, there is no science where laws are not applicable to individual cases, where we do not therefore have syllogisms of the form illustrated above, end quote. Applicable once again to all sciences, like in Peirce's method among the sciences, which references the individual sample to the case and without which inquiry could not function. Sometimes in certain regions of science, we can hit upon validity. Other times we must rest content with inductive strength. But this too has in Husserl's estimation, it's telos, dare we say pragmatic telos. For in the, pragma in the practical realm, we would like to get as close to the truth as we can. There for Husserl, quote, all scientific methods which do not themselves have the character of actual validating arguments are abbreviations and substitutes for such validating arguments, end quote. Further for Husserl, one ought seek to describe elegantly and simply, avoiding what he calls Chinese box complexity. The emphasis for Husserl as for Peirce is on the economy of thinking, but scientific logic can also take the role of the complex technology by which we win new knowledge, as some scientific methods are, Husserl writes, auxiliary devices which serve to prepare for, to facilitate, to ensure, or to render possible future processes of validation, say Peirce's algebra. So help me pragmatism. One is tempted to complete Husserl's sentence. In each case, the emphasis is on science as a good habit that better aims towards the goal of the sciences as perpetually increasing the realm of truth, but which is always and everywhere the aim that permits the process and thus irreducible to any moment or moments of the process itself. One should not reduce the set maker to the set. Pragmatism and phenomenology both sound the warning against this dangerous error of rationalist modernity, which constantly tries to reduce the set maker of inquiry to the idolatry of acquired sets. For example, psychology alone or mathematics alone or pure a priori ideas alone without paying heed to the ongoing telos of value seeking and value appreciation. What does all truth seeking share in common? For Husserl, the theory of science aiming to describe what all sciences share in common, a priori and a posteriori, hits upon quote, a certain unity of validatory interconnection, a certain unity in the stepwise ascent of its validatory agreement arguments, and this form of unity has itself a lofty teleological meaning in the attainment of the highest goal of knowledge for which all science strives, end quote. Wherein research into specific truths is the means to this end. One might call it the wisdom lovingly sought by philosophy. Each science is validated by its membership in the same activity by a continual clarifying of ideas, rather than a once-off clarifying by ways of Cartesian hyperbolic skepticism, followed by hyperbolic certainty. Yet, in common with Descartes, but recognizing the greater difficulty, the process is for the sake of an ongoing project of clarification. And Husserl later in Cartesian Meditations praised Descartes for bringing to light the importance of the individual cogito, even as he missed the cogitamus, the one that will produce for us the objective scientific literature. 
Uh, so this is, of course, just the opening of the logical investigations. Husserl is, by this point, already, I think, a pragmatist. But from this point, and particularly by way of his reading of Royce, his pragmatism grows. But this is not to suggest a takeover. Ryan points out that Peirce is a phenomenologist. Royce certainly was a phenomenologist. And Husserl was a pragmatist. I think we can read in these thinkers of the late 19th and early 20th century, a Rosetta Stone, that can continue to be of use today by showing the mutual relevance of the humanities and the natural sciences to the contemporary academy and of philosophy itself as an interpreter between them, standing, as Royce puts the matter, at the neutral ground at which different practitioners of scientific domains can gather to compare problems and results and seek for shared methodologies, helping to overcome isolation and jealousy. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have a discussion now. The, who is uh, Simone Bernardi della Rosa? Is a PhD candidate in our university, and uh, he is working exactly on uh, the notion of habit in Perth. Uh, once again, sorry, I have to leave the meeting. Uh, very, very sorry, but uh, thank you, thank you, and you. bye bye to everyone. Bye. Thank you, Professor, and thank you also for the, the paper that, of course, is particularly interesting for me. And I just want to highlight a couple of points and uh, a couple of questions in five minutes, and then we can open the discussion and we can, you can write also on the chat and then we can leave you there, uh, leave you there speaking. So, uh, first of all, I think I appreciate a lot the, um, also the historical part of inquiry because I think that could be, uh, like in this case, very helpful for a theoretical comparison, but not in a strictly philological way, uh, but most in order to give back the atmosphere, the humus, the scientific humus and the relationship, the relations of a, a given period, that it's especially in this crucial moment of cohabits also of the late 19th century, it's very important and it's, it's mutual the influence America and USA and Europe. And from a uh, second point is from a Persian perspective, I'd like also to, to stress another demonstration, I mean, it's the others, of course, that we already have, about the anti-reductionist pragmatism developed by, by Peirce, in the sense that I think habit is the key for this, since the, the most simple statement uh, is that an action, we also see in the paper, cannot fulfill the meaning of a general. And this is so important because it's so easy to understand that it's so strange that uh, a lot of scholars then made some mistake, I think. Of course, these topics could lead to the problem of what is general and what is individual. And it's a very wider issue that is also related to this topic. Um, also related to this topic, there is the problem of, yeah, the, the main point for me, for example, for habit and the logic, or habit has logic, is the fact that habit is the leading principle of, of inference. And it's not a case, I think, that in algebra of logic in 1818 is the paper in which uh, Peirce started to work on the habit as a leading principle, a habit as the psychological counterpart of logical roots. Of course, Scotus, it's important is this because for Scotus, um, ideas and judgment stay habitually in our deep soul. Um, but it's, I don't know, it's not easy to, to, to make uh, only one statement about this, but I, I think there is a, a lot of work to do. But regarding my, the main question I have, the first one, it's I, I, I'd like to, to emphasize the anti habitual in some sense, the anti-systematic side of Peirce, uh, like his theoretical restlessness, that it's also, I don't know, this life, I think it's a demonstration of this. So rightly in the paper, you emphasize the absolute tendency of inquiry, and I agree, and also the distinction between true and false belief, 
uh, on the basis uh, on the basis of the of the fact that uh, the the rest of the inquiry like only to believe uh, conduct to to this. But Peirce also told us in some paper that in every stage of inquiry, we are prepared to act in what we believe in a given moment, in that given moment. And we cannot think otherwise, even if the belief is not validated or even if it's false. So um, among in this critical aspect, I think, and among with this continuous fallibilism that of course you highlighted, is restless research that is visible also in the way he worked, like changing the 20 draft of the same paper. Uh, this this sub aspect could be another side of the same coin that you alight or not. And the second question is focus uh, on a possible, maybe different shade between pragmatism and phenomenology, in which I'm really interested as also um, graduated in semiotics that is connected also with semiotics. Um, I draw inspiration from the part in which you talk about uh, logical inquiry as the bracketing of what we do yet know. Uh, but speaking in a broader sense, I've ever seen in uh, literature, uh, especially in semiotics and pragmatism, of course, literature, I always seen I'd like in the, the Persian semiotics and pragmatism as two ways of inquiry focusing on mainly on what is implicit and what is postulated from our judgment, what uh, remains in absence, like the definition of science, for example. So in this respect, often I saw that as a maybe anti-phenomenological bracketing, uh, remembering also the first uh, paper of one of the first paper of first uh, the anti -criticism. So in your last part of the paper, of course, you had like a very important point that is very connected to this. But in this respect, a, a lot of literature talk about this anti-bracketing in this sense. So what do you think about it? I just want to say this could be a generic difference between these two important methodologies, or we have to circumscribe, circumscribe better this aspect. And thank you very much again for the paper. Thank you. Well, these are really excellent comments, and uh, let me let me respond to uh, to them. I, I think actually my my answer is related, um, which is so I, I I take purse here to be saying um, there is something there it's 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 not very much and it's uh i mean I, I don't think it's a whole lot more you know concrete than what you get you know at, at book 10 of aristotle's ethics we're aiming for something and uh you know when when we get it we really like it and sometimes we 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 miss it and we think we have it and we don't have it uh but when we get it there's something enduring about it and it's you know good and that's what we're aiming for um other than that, you can't say very much about it, right? So this is the, you know, the end of the ethics. Well, this is this thing that we're all aiming for and it's happiness, but I can't really tell you what it is. You know, you'll know it when you have it because it'll be, you know, uh, it'll, 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 you know, keep there, keep you there for a long time. Um, and that seems to me to be, you know, Purse's sense. Like there's all of these habits in the world uh, and the habits are changing uh, and we have to be really on our uh, best behavior so that our, our habits do not preclude this possibility of getting to something you know, uh, that's going to be better and more sustainable. Uh, but always there, there's, there's some kind of North Star guiding the process. And that's what I see in person at Aristotle. There, there's something there, this is Josiah Royce as well, uh, what we're aiming for. And you know, Husserl puts this, uh, as a faithful inquiry, right? You know, always and everywhere, 2,000 years ago and nowadays, uh, when we're part of this community, we want to be faithfully describing what we see. But other than that, you can't predetermine it because what you see is going to be relative to the moment, to the perspective. Um, and so I think for Purse, what's really going on is keeping your eye on both things. Uh, 
Now you talk about, you know, the anti-habitual. I think this is why, you know, Husserl is so shocked by this in the beginning, uh, because clearly there is something anti-habitual going on. Always and everywhere, we're looking for the same thing, you know, for Aristotle, happiness, for Percy, truth, etc. cetera. Um, and I think that's, that remains there. It's, uh, but it's always going to be the two things. There's some kind of absolute telos of, of inquiry, and there's going to be then all of these habits that surround it, create it, et cetera. Uh, but one never reduces to the other. And I think in you know, uh, 800 different ways, this is what Husserl keeps on mentioning uh, throughout the logical investigations. Uh, and then from the ideas, and he says everybody misunderstands him about this, you just cannot collapse this one seeking activity into the whole collection of the sought, nor does the mere fact that something is sought obliviate the seeking itself. You just need to be doing both things. You need the absolute telos towards truth, and then you need this kind of collected uh, habit towards truth. Um, and then I'd say, yeah, absolutely for your second question. So there is an anti-bracketing that happens uh, because for Peirce, this, this algebra is just a moment. Uh, Lotze has this as well. When we're involved in the inquiry, that means we, we don't know what we're seeking. Uh, we're aiming for it. Once we have uh, what we're aiming for, well, then we stop seeking it. We have the belief. Uh, but I would say here, this habit of the bracketing is important uh, because it at least reminds the person, the inquirer, well, I might be wrong, right? I, I might just need to re-bracket uh, my belief uh, in order to treat this in a provisional way, what I have been treating, uh, treating absolutely. Um, and... You know, we, we set them up and we put them aside. Uh, and again, Husserl is clear about this, that he is, uh, his, his bracketing is not a skeptical denial. It's, it's a moment. But I'd say this is you know, precisely the moment that the scientist is engaged in, uh, in any field, you know, when we're trying to figure out what something is. So just that moment of thinking about something without committing to it. Um, and I think that's, you know, a lot of what we, you know, philosophers do when we're teaching undergraduates, uh, you know, there's a strong habit of mind that just wants to, you know, you know, come, come across something and just say, is it true or is it false, period, and then stick to it. And then reason is about defending the truth, you know, the truth of the truth and the falsity of the falsity. Uh, and philosophy reminds us, well, we should be able to, you know, bracket this, see how it fits into our sets. Um, semiotics, then, you know, it, it enters into it again, because we're looking at this particular analyzed thing in relation to other things. How do they aim together? Uh, and as you put it, there's some kind of relation between, you know, the, the individual uh, and the set. Uh, and these are going back and forth. And I think, in, in, you know, also, uh, you know, Hermann Lotze from this period is really uh, keen on this, uh, that we, we need to be making both movements towards the set, towards the coherence, then back to the individual. Uh, there's a bracketing that lets us keep on participating in this. Uh, but the end of this is, you know, Lotz is frank about and Peirce is frank about and, you know, Husserl later on becomes frank about after logical investigations. Well, we're doing all this because we want to have a better relation with truth and reality. This kind of uh, bracketing is, is an aid to this, but it's not an end in itself. Um, so I, you know, just to kind of, you know, su summarize my, my response to your two questions, I think, you know, the, the pragmatists and the phenomenologists, you know, they want to have their cake and, their, and, and eat it too. Uh, they're, they're not going to say it's going to be just, just one or the other, but there's going to be different moments of inquiry. But always we have to keep in mind this re-possibility of bracketing once again uh, so that we don't become you know, wedded to our temporary formulations. But we want to become wedded to them in some way because we don't want to just be completely bewildered in the world. We want to have these you know, pragmatic solutions. Uh, but by calling them pragmatic solutions, we're saying, yeah, but there might be, there might be something better. And then we go back to the bracketing process uh, you know, analyzing it in this kind of, you know, sk skeptical space. Uh, and it keeps on going on, which I think is what makes this, you know, so rich. And I'm glad that's what you're focusing on. I think it's the, the really, really complex work of philosophy. There's no easy path answers here. 
Uh, but what I like about person and host role at this point is that, well, they tell you what the problem is, right? This is what you're going to have to be doing. It's going to be a long, hard slog, you know, but you're going to make progress making it. So thank you, Simone. No, thank you to you. Uh, yeah, was, as quote in person is uh, to self-analyze our habits, we can only start from the actual condition and then back forward to, to see from what uh, originates. Yes, so thank you. And we can start also, and we have a question from Andrea Staiti and two questions from Maria Regina Brioschi. And another question from Professor Stewart. Hey, can I start? Yep. Hey, Jason, how are you? Oh, doing very well. How about yourself? Good to see you. Yeah, good, good. Uh, your beard grew faster than mine, I see. <laughs> Anyways, so, um, no, thanks for your paper. Excellent, uh, as usual. I'm always impressed um, by the, 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 the breadth and the depth also of your references. I mean, you really uh, researched these materials very thoroughly. Um, just you know, for the sake of argument and dialectics, you know, I'd like to put a little bit of pressure on some of the things you were uh, you were saying, and to see you know how far you want to take your claims, um, because you know, on the one hand, I think it's really super interesting to explore you know this avenue that leads from Göttingen to America, basically. Um, on the other hand, uh, precisely because it's so interesting, I think uh, I would probably recommend to be careful in not overstating you know things because in that way you you know you might actually detract to precisely the the interest of, of, of what you're saying and so here are sort of two worries or two sort of uh, kinds of feedback uh, the first is why say so you know bluntly and explicitly that Husserl was a pragmatist I mean that to me sounds like a you know a claim that um, an uncharitable reader or, or listener could easily kind of, you know, dismiss um, just for a few reasons. Well, first, Husserl knew pragmatism. And so if he had wanted to define himself as a pragmatist, he could have done it. You know, he, he, he knew the label. And there are also texts where he uses the label pragmatist or pragmatic in a kind of pejorative sense. What I'm thinking here in particular is, an, um, there is this very interesting uh, lecture course called Natur und Geist from 1927, where Husserl criticizes Rickert, the, the neo-Kantian, who was the staunchest enemy of pragmatism. You know, he, he wrote really sort of obscene things against James uh, and the pragmatist tradition. He, he thought that this whole notion that, you know, the truth is, a, the truth is pragmatic, is uh, abominable, et cetera. And so Husserl, in a very kind of clever and malicious way, in that lecture course, accuses Rickert of being a sort of crypto pragmatist. <laughs> because, I mean, the way Husserl sort of reconstructs Rickert's argument is that for Rickert, you know, the world is a kind of unsurveyable manifold of uh, disorganized materials. And so we need concepts and we need concept formation to try to overcome this kind of, you know, uh, unsurveyable multiplicity. Um, and Husserl says, okay, despite his rejection of pragmatism, Rickert is himself a kind of a sort of pragmatic, sort of uh, you know pragmatist in disguise who believes that the 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 sort of uh, let's say the purchase that our concepts have on the world is somehow explainable or can be traced back to our need right to kind of overcome the problems that the world poses to us. And Husserl uses this in a negative sense. So I, 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 that's, that's one thing, and that's kind of a reference that you might want to consider. Uh, and I, again, I think it's a kind of ironic and interesting twist uh, to Husserl's argument that he would characterize Rickert as a pragmatist, considering that Rickert was the most outspoken you know, critic of pragmatism in, in Germany. The other thing is more theoretical, and that's, you know, I would put it this way. There are at least two characteristic things about Husserlian phenomenology that I would have a hard time finding in the writings of uh, the pragmatists. But with, with a disclaimer that my knowledge of, of, of pragmatism is you know, very limited vis-a-vis -vis yours and the other participants in this group. Most of it I actually learned when I was a student uh, in Milan from Rossella and others. Uh, but then I 
took other paths. So just briefly, the two things are the idea of an intuitive fulfillment as an experience of truth, right? As something that in some particular instances, in one sense is a point of no return. So you have an intuitive fulfillment of certain intentions and there are cases and the sphere of logic is one of those where you can verbally profess the idea that they are fallible, revisable and so forth. But that is a flatus vocis because if you understand what you're doing, when you grasp certain basic truths of logic or logical relations, what's excluded is precisely the idea of you know, revising them at some point, right? So this notion that you find in Quine, which is kind of a, you know, a late manifestation of pragmatism, that our, I don't know, the, the principle of contradiction is not categorically different from some other belief. It's just deeper in our network of beliefs. Who's I would say this is nonsense. You know, it's completely crazy to, to, to think in those terms. You know, when you, when, when, when you argue something like that, it's because you never took pains to actually study the kind of consciousness that's involved, right, in, in these types of judgments. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is this, my understanding of pragmatism is that the sort of philosophical intuition that's behind it is a kind of holistic notion, right? There is a kind of holism uh, that as far as I understand it is typical of, of pragmatism. Um, and by holism, I mean the idea that Basically, the world, especially if you take process philosophy as a form of pragmatism or somehow a, a branch of pragmatism, there is a kind of holistic notion of reality that then, you know, the, 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 the process of inquiry is something that sort of step by step progressively expands and, and incorporates, you know, broader and broader regions of reality, even if you can't encompass the whole thing. But the, there is a kind of one, the same fundamental movement of inquiry, right, that's involved in the exploration of various segments of reality. And here I think the basic philosophical intuition in Husserl is, act, is by contrast, profoundly pluralistic. So uh, I, I would ask you, how would you reconcile the notion of regional ontologies and the idea that you ground the sciences by highlighting, by laying bare the fundamental essences that demarcate, you know, different regions of reality that are not traceable, you can't trace them back to one and the same sort of, you know, fundamental notion. It's like, you know, you have to intuitively grasp the, the factors, the, the, you know, the, the principles that, that ground the demarcations of reality. And there is no way that you can dissolve them or trace them back to a more fundamental continuity of thought or, or, you know, processual nature of reality and things like that. So these are, to me, a kind of, you know, the, 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 you know, the points where your project of describing Husserl as a kind of pragmatist, you know, might be a little bit sort of pushing it a bit too far. So maybe what you might want to, to say to sort of re, I don't know, scale back the ambition a little bit is to highlight the pragmatist moments that I think, you know, you very well highlighted in, in Husserl, but whether you can really make such an, you know, stronger claim, I think, you know, it is at least problematic because of these three points that I tried to make and sorry for speaking too much. Thanks. I'm glad you spoke as much as you did. This is, this is wonderful stuff. So I, I, I thank you very much for it. Um, so uh, l let me say a, a, a few things. So um, you know, there, there's some etymology to do here with the with with the word pragmatism. Um, and I w one of my all-time favorite uh, stories in the history of philosophy is the 1908 uh, Heidelberg Congress, uh, when these Americans show up on the you know the steamships and they get to Heidelberg, and there's just this nasty nasty fight going on between pragmatism and idealism. Uh, with the uh, conference organizers physically holding people apart so they wouldn't beat each other up and trying to uh, separate them into different rooms so they wouldn't riot. And the Americans were just totally confused by this, uh, what was going on. Um, this is, and they didn't take part in it, right? The Americans did not start rioting along with, with the pragmatists. And really, I think what happened is pragmatism just simply became the word that was the new word for empiricism. 
Uh, and then the same fighting just started taking place again. But uh, the, the, the you know, young Turks uh, among the, the Germans who were, you know, saying that Kant was silly, they're saying, oh, pragmatism is right. And, um, you know, Husserl wisely stayed away from Heidelberg. He could have gone. Um, but I, I think that was that was really the context. And it's you know hard to think nowadays in our in our uh, you know world after you know Spep and the rest of it when you know things are so open and it's easy to have philosophical conversations. But uh, th there was something really quite nasty going on. Uh, and I really think that if Husserl had frank had frankly ever said that he was a pragmatist, that would have meant warfare. And he was already having a really really hard time saying what he was saying which is that we should be allowed to take psychology seriously. He's getting attacked for that. Um, so I, I think, you know, uh, you know, Husserl was a pretty politic guy. I, in, a, in a way of speaking, he, you know, picked some harsh fights, you know, but he knew the kinds of people who would stick up for, for him. Uh, and they were not the young Turks, right? Those were people who were throwing bricks. Um, so anyways, I'd, I'd say, yeah, I think, a, you know, there, there's a lot of etymology there with, with pragmatism. When you look at Husserl's, you know, actual conversations with students of the pragmatists, and this is people like, you know, Hawking and, you know, and forward, it's a very different kind of conversation. And I think there, you know, Husserl was just code switching, as they sometimes call it in, you know, sociology these days, he could talk one way with the pragmatists. But when he's writing these things in print, I don't even believe that the word pragmatism means the same thing as we mean when we say pragmatism. Um, why do I, you know, call him a pragmatist? Uh, you know, this is, um, you know, because I'm, I'm reading, the, I was reading the news about, uh, you know, a rocket falling from the sky, and I thought, you know, maybe it would hit me. And I wanted to just go ahead and say what I thought. Um, this is, you know, really what I think, and this is, a, it, it's a big project, and it, it's something that I'm going to, you know, really need to work through uh, but just in case the, the rocket did strike me, I wanted to put on record that I think, sure, sure Husserl is a pragmatist. Now, there's a lot of footnotes there. Uh, and probably the biggest footnote of all is uh, the kind of pragmatism that he's going to grow more and more and more in sympathy with is this Roycean kind. Uh, and we have really good evidence that uh, Royce really endorses it. Uh, and this is through his interactions with the graduate student Winthrop Bell, who wanted to criticize Royce in his dissertation, and Husserl was criticizing those criticisms. So really, in other words, sticking up for Royce. Um, and in the fullness of time, I think this is the connection really worth exploring. It was ex begun to be explored by David Goikochia and uh, Jackie Kegley. Uh, in the 70s and 80s. They just happened to read them side by side and were like, wow, this sounds a lot alike. Um, and now that we know concretely that, sure, Husserl was really into Royce, now I think that this is really the point where we can say, this is the kind of pragmatism that Husserl could run with. And Royce's pragmatism was a very guarded, cautious kind of pragmatism. Uh, and along with Peirce, uh, what I want to say here is that these are philosophers who are pragmatists and they're phenomenologists and they're medieval logicians. They were not pragmatists, period. Um, and in other words, I, I think for, for Royce and for Peirce and for Husserl, pragmatism is a moment of philosophy. It's not the whole of philosophy. Uh, but I'd say the same thing about phenomenology, that Husserl thought that phenomenology was a moment of philosophy. It wasn't the whole of philosophy. Uh, he is going to explore this region. Uh, Peirce explores this region. Royce explores this region. So they're putting on different hats. Um, you know, back to etymology, I think, you know, something kind of strange happens with the na you know, name brandification of philosophy that's happening about this time. Pragmatism becomes very popular. Uh, Peirce is confused about, about why this has happened, uh, but it's kind of a catchy name. Uh, I think, you know, Husserl, uh, you know, it's like, kind of like, I can do this too. Um, so I, I you know, and, you know, the, you know, suddenly philosophy was becoming a mass market, right? Heidelberg was this great big Congress before this people had been kind of, you know, by themselves. Uh, now, you know, this is back to the etymology, but back to the kind of the serious philosophical stuff. Um, I'd say that I, your points about intuition fulfillment 
uh, and pluralism are absolutely in Royce. So for Royce, uh, you know, he talks about this in terms of uh, loyalty to loyalty. Uh, this idea that no loyalty that you can ever have scientifically can ever comprise everything. It can only ever describe a certain region. And then you have to just let other people do their own thing and, and appreciate what they're doing. Uh, so there's a kind of humility there, but that's what Royce calls attention to in his remarks on Husserl in 1902. Like, here's this guy, Husserl, who's respecting both domains. So he's res respecting the domains of these empirical disciplines as being able to you know, pop up and become diverse. He's respecting the domain of uh, the, the people who deal with what you're calling the, uh, you know, the intuition fulfillment. He's Husserl is saying you cannot reduce the one to the other, which is what everybody was trying to do. The empiricists are trying to reduce the qualities or these pure relations to empirical sensations. Uh, the idealists are trying to reduce uh, data to some kind of preformed categories. And I, you know, when I read Heidegger, I'm not, you know, I, I, I think Heidegger backslides. I don't think he's a great thinker. Sorry about this for people who like Heidegger. Uh, but I see Heidegger as somebody who, in being in time, is you know trying to say, oh, I, I can tell you a scientist what to do next because of my great understanding of conditions. And Husserl will say, no, you just cannot do this. The, the, what the psychologists are already doing is so specialized, uh, so advanced within their domain that we can only you know watch what they're doing at the same time that we're saying, but yet we cannot you know reduce out the you know the intuition fulfillment. That the mathematicians and the and the, and uh, and uh, the logicians are doing, so that's what what Royce calls out uh, as Husserl's phenomenology. And I, I don't want to mention this in the paper. And uh, you know, I um, you know, I, I, I you, you would have probably been annoyed if I had said this too. But I really think that Husserl calls himself a phenomenologist, starts calling himself a phenomenologist because of Royce. Uh, so Royce calls attention in 1902 to, wow, these fantastic phenomenological researches that Husserl is doing that let you make both moves. And at this point, Royce is like the huge in the world of philosophy and Husserl is, you know, you know, appears, you know, in the late second half of lists of promising young German logicians. Uh, and notably, it's to Royce's student Hawking that uh, Husserl, this is by what Hawking said, first says his own position is phenomenology. Uh, but it's this ability to do these precise two things that you, you mentioned. He's going to give you intuitive fulfillments, not deny these. Royce does this as well. And he's also going to point to this profound pluralism uh, and not try to reduce these. Uh, you know, I think what he's doing is you know, fairly simple in the logical investigations. 20 years later, he's still, you know, you know, fighting with people who think he's trying to do something else, trying to reduce to one side or the other side. I think a lot of this confusion of the Göttingen school, the students first think he's one thing and then they think he's the other thing. It's just because they missed this move that Roy saw that he's giving us both plurality, but also this single pole of, of intuitive fulfillment. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think, you know, purse is necessarily the, the very best place to look, except to say that if Peirce had not been doing this, Royce and James wouldn't have also been doing it. Uh, but then because James is a popularizer and he really goes off in one direction, that's uh, kind of over-exaggerated the pragmatic elements. I'd say, sure, he, you know, Husserl is a pragmatist. The big asterisk is really a Roycean, Percian pragmatist. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of comparative work that's going to need to be done. But when we look deeply into Peirce and Royce, I'd say, absolutely, we're going to find those two things, that there's some kind of intuitive pull, which does a lot of work, but not all of it. And then there's going to be this, this world of uh, you know, empirical, processive, you know, regional ontologies that we just have to discover in time. But they're not just a bewildering diversity. They're all together unified by sharing in common something. They share in common some of these intuitive rules. They share in common this telos towards truth. Uh, and those are the absolute parts. And I, you know, I just think it's notable that even people who are very sympathetic to this project nowadays, you know, have you know problems with the you know the absolute part of it. 
what's there? It's right. It's just, it's saying, you know, and this is the part of inquiry that this is going to deal with the intuitive fulfillments. Uh, you know, person Royce and, and, you know, James and Husserl, I think are way better than Heidegger. Uh, so anyways, that's, I don't want to mean to pick any fights with Heideggerians here, but thank you very much, Andrea. That's, that's really, really helpful what you said. Thank you, Jason. Uh, sorry, I have to go. Uh, my time is up, so I'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Thank Bye. you. Bye. It's probably my turn because I saw that uh, John Stur left. Uh, so I have mainly um, two questions. I mean, I have more because I'm actually working on um, Percy's manuscripts of the mid-90s. So I am really interested in the connection in between Peirce and Schroeder and, and Rousseau. But probably my question, my specific question on, on these points are not that interesting. So um, one point that I want to ask and discuss with you is the following one. Um, as far as I read Husserl, it seems to me that there is like this huge difference from a methodological point of view and uh, probably already Simone and Andrea mentioned something about that, uh, in between the, the place of evidence uh, and accordingly of intuition, we have already discussed a little bit um, this point with Mark Ockrent last seminar. Uh, so I just wonder uh, what do you think about this, uh, this, this methodological difficulty maybe, uh, because, um, I mean, Percy is, is pretty clear and harsh about uh, wh what is the place of intuition in cognition. Um, and then there is another more specific question that I asked because we know that when Peirce at least speak of uh, logic, he uh, mentioned something very specific. I, I mean, he, he, he varies. Um, and it depends from passages, but uh, when uh, there is a, a quote that I um, found a while ago when you were talking, uh, and it is Peirce the, um, that reviews John Dewey's studies in logical theory. So at least, I don't remember the, the, the date, but uh, for sure is after 1903. Uh, and he put Husser, um in his comments in between the German school of logicians and uh, Percy's arch criticism is uh, the following one. And I, I was wondering, uh, what do you think about that? Percy says, Sigurd, Wund, etc., Husserl, are engaged upon problems which must be acknowledged to underline the others, but attack them in a manner which the exact logicians, as Peirce was supposed to be, uh, regard as entirely irrelevant because they make truth, which is a matter of fact, to be a matter of a way of thinking or even of linguistic expression. So I don't remember precisely what Peirce read of Husserl, but uh, the fact that he put Husserl uh, together with Sigvard and Wundt was uh, interesting for me. Uh, in, in the reconstruction that you made, um, there is a place for that, or what do you think? Oh, sure. Um, well, the, for, for, let, me, let me start with the second first. I, I think uh, that the second answer is fairly simple, which is um, I think that Peirce uh, was entirely getting this from Royce's 1902 APA address. Uh, so Peirce was not, you know, reading German fluently at this point. Royce was the guy who was, you know, doing this and keeping up with this. Uh, Royce and Peirce were friends. Um, I think that uh, he's following Royce's lead on this, uh, but he was missing a little joke that Royce made. <clears throat> uh, so, so namely, Royce's joke in his APA address was he said, um, uh, you know, you know, Husserl is really, you know, defending the pure ideas against uh, reduction to psychology. Uh, but parting is such sweet sorrow that he keeps on attending to the psychological stuff. Um, now, Royce was just making a little joke here. Uh, really, he was saying, oh, Husserl is, is doing both in his rhetoric. He really wants to champion the pure ideas. But in his pages, he goes on page after page after page of psychological description. Uh, I think Peirce just 
missed uh, Royce pointing out that Husserl is doing both things and instead kind of follows a little bit too forcefully the joke itself, the, you know, parting a sweet sorrow part, uh, and then says, oh, well, you know, Husserl is just one more psychologizer, you know, which is absurd, right? If you'd actually read, you know, the logical investigations, nobody would ever say this. Uh, but if you read just Royce's joke, you could say that. This is, you know, one of the problems with humor uh, and why you have to be careful with it. Um, and uh, so anyways, yeah, I, I think that uh, it's just kind of one of those, uh, you know, um, what's, what's what I'm looking for? Red herring that's put people off the track along with the, the comment about James and Husserl and, and you, know, you know, Husserl just being another, you know, logician, which was totally hearsay, but for a lot of people, it's like, oh, well, therefore we don't need to con compare these two. Um, but again, I mean, as with, um, you know, Husserl's own understanding of purse, I think there was a way that this could operate without him really being aware of it. Uh, and likewise, through Royce, uh, I think there was a way that Husserl came to be able to influence purse. Uh, just by the way that, that Royce himself was personally in, interpreting him. Uh, so there's a move uh, towards, in, in, in uh, purse to, uh, some topics that were treated earlier in the seminar, so you know I won't get into them. Uh, but a lot of that happens, you know, when Purse is like, "Wait a minute, you know, I, I can't just be letting this German guy do this. I can do this, you know, myself." Uh, which I think he does, you know, just with this little bit of knowledge of Husserl that he gets from Royce, uh, that he can do, you know, phenomenology too. Um, your uh, your other point about um, this, uh, you know, difficult relation of uh, evidence and intuition. Um, I think, and I, I'm you know, really, um, you know, uh, what well, I, I, I really think back to, uh, to Lotz at a lot of points here. Uh, so Lotz is who Husserl was, was, was very carefully reading, uh, in the early part of the, the 20th century. Um, now the way that, uh, Lotz puts this is that there's a kind of, uh, value uh, that makes something evidence for us. And it's this value that says that something is something else or it's kind of like something else. Um, and Lotz's key point is that this is the unifying term between the two kinds of science, the pure, intuitive, and the empirical, uh, that in both of them, we're looking for values. Back to Plato and the Phaedo, uh, just this really basic ability to say that something is something else or is not something else. Uh, as the great uh, you know, uh, Italian philosopher Thomas puts this, you know, analogy. Um, and so I think uh, evidence and intuition is not, uh, are, are two different things. Rather, it's, you don't get intuition without evidence. There is going to be the sameness in the in the purely logical endeavor. It's just that you're also doing this in the world of uh, empirical inductive probabilities, but then you just have to recognize that you're going to get a different standard of evidence. It's not going to be that kind of absolute certainty that Professor Staiti was mentioning. Uh, it's going to be probabilistic evidence, and then here Per says. Uh, and Lotsa says too, without using the word pragmatism, like there's certain things we just know in the empirical world and we call them, you know, laws as Lotsa puts us, and, you know, Lotsa, I think is, you know, makes this beautiful point. We shouldn't call them laws when we're talking about these natural scientific things, we should talk about rules. And by this, we mean like really, really, really good evidence for something that we would never doubt because it works so well, which is like the kind of evidence that we get in intuition uh, and it's aiming at the same thing, right? They're both aiming at, at identity or, or what Lotza calls individuality. Uh, and this, by the way, is also what Roy said Thomas Aquinas was about, trying to figure out what is the individual, uh, whether through you know, divine law or natural law or you know, human law or whatever. We're always aiming for the same thing of being able to say what something is. Um, and then you say, well, you're always going to need evidence. Uh, you're always aiming towards that uh, ability to affirm the individual. 
uh, but you're going to have to do it in different ways. With the logical identity, you say, absolutely, there's no doubt about this validity. The empirical world, you know, you, you should you know, never ever say there's no such thing as a black swan. Uh, as the 19th you know, century you know, logic textbooks used to do, because there, you know, there might be a black swan in Australia or whatever. Um, so I don't see there being um, a, 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 you know, any kind of harsh difference between intuition and evidence. I'd say you know, evidence becomes it's, you know, the, the broader category. Uh, it's involved in intuition, also in empirical research. Then, uh, you know, we can do, and I, I think, you know, Immanuel Kant would say it would be fine with this. You know, we can do these intuitive researches that involve a certain kind of evidence. Uh, there's this other kind of, of research we can also be doing. Kant just says that's for other people to do, right? And then I think it was just the Kantians who wanted to lock down the project as to what Kant was doing. Um, I take you know, people like Husserl and Peirce as you know, following the Kantian project in a way of saying there's going to be this intuitive evidence, uh, but now we're going to open up the, the world of evidence more broadly. Uh, and then Lotza also shows how to do this, uh, how we can think of evidence in these different spheres. Did you have a, a follow-up on that? Mm, yeah, I, am, I have still some doubts about Peirce's uh, agreement with what you said and is this continuity with Kant in this sense, but uh, I see that there is also as Claudia with questions. So thank you for now. Thank you. And let, let me, you know, let me just, you know, add on really quickly, and this is not Peirce, but this is Royce. And of course, Royce was heavily influenced by Peirce. Um, it's Kantian, but it's not Kant. And the problem that Royce had with Kant is that Kant wanted the, his, his categories to be the final ones. And Royce's move was just like, well, you can't do that, Kant. You can't just say, just because you find these intuitive certainties in this domain, therefore that's all the certainties there are. Uh, but he wasn't complaining about the certainties. It was just the fixed set of them. Like these should be able to expand. Um, and I think that can be read in continuity with Peirce, that he, you know, Peirce is going to object to the, the rigidity of the categories. You know, but Peirce also likes, you know, categories. It's just that these should be able to, you know, emerge pragmatically in time. But I would yeah, be glad to correspond with you further about this. And I think, yeah, th there's no way, I think you're right, there's no way we can reduce Peirce to Kant on this. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And thank you, Jason, for these amazing presentation. Very, very thought provoking. Um, I also have a couple of questions. The first is really, down to earth and kind of philological, if you want. I'm really interested in this, um, man, uh, in the copy of studies in logic that you mentioned that Lat Franklin would have given to Husserl. And I wanted to ask you if it's like, uh, where is it? And uh, is, it, is it online somehow? Do you, is it physical somewhere? Um, that was the first uh, curiosity. Uh, and also like kind of connected to this, whether you know of the interactions in terms of like, did they like Lat Franklin also was um, a great physiologist and a contributor to the theory of colors, and obviously we know that like these were uh, topics of interest uh, for pragmatists and phenomenologists alike. And I wanted to know if there is any, I don't know if you know more, if you could say something more about that. Um, and the other question is that is very different and is perhaps a bit too broad, but it was also like kind of, uh, it, it was rather like grounded on some feelings of the possible differences between uh, Husserl and Peirce. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, am, I was really pleased to see your like historical reconstruction of their uh, ways, which like the ways which Husserl would have known uh, pragmatism and maybe Peirce's pragmatism or Royce's pragmatism, uh, and also the like uh, idea that both of them would have uh, thought about a continuous back and forth between the practice of science and the logic of science as a way to doing philosophy. Um, the thing that I cannot really pin down is like it seems to me intuitively that there is a difference in the way in which they approach this back and forth. Uh, namely that for Peirce, there is an evolutionary approach to logic and science. 
and logic evolves together with science. Whereas it seems to me, but I, my knowledge of Husserl is much more limited, that for what I remember from reading Husserl, um, logic doesn't have the same uh, evolutionary character. It's rather a almost platonic logic uh, that exists there once and for all. And that justifies also the kind of uh, possibility of uh, acknowledging its forms in intuition, which, which Peirce doesn't have. Um, although Peirce, I mean, I mean, Peirce as well would say that when something is present to you, you cannot reject it. Like you cannot just by saying that this is not there, pretend that it's not there. However, it's a very different way of acknowledging this presence than, than Husserl's way of acknowledging the presence of a logical form. So I wondered whether you have any thoughts, further thoughts there, or whether you would say, okay, this is just a fundamental discrepancy on top of this kind of other similarity? Uh, sure. So the, uh, the, the book uh, is uh, at the Husserl Archives Leuven. Um, in uh, one, of, one of the footnotes in my paper, uh, I, um, I give a, if, if you do a search, control F search for Fonger, Thomas Fonger, uh, it, it gives some of the transcription that he did from the, from the first pages uh, that's all that exists in the cybersphere right now is just his, his few pages, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, yeah, so if we go through the book, uh, you can see Husserl skipped some of the articles, but he read Christine Ladd's article, uh, and he, um, uh, read Purse's own article. Uh, and in both of these, he, um, underlined this notion of uh, sameness. Um, and uh, there, I, I don't know Christine Ladd's work very well, but um, you know, I, I think here there's a notion that uh, of uh, like the, the quality uh, or the predicate uh, is for Purse this, you know, and for Ladd is, uh, uh, is this work of sameness. So it's, uh, you know, there, there's something, you know, of, of a, you know, fiat about it. Um, but uh, the, the fiat here is saying, yeah, but what I mean is that this is the same as something else. Uh, and, you know, one could say, you know, this is going to work different places, you know, different, you know, different countries in the world call, you know, different colors, different things. They notice different colors, but, you know, all of them are making in order to make the quality claim some ju judgment about sameness. Um, so Husserl is attending to this. He's attending to this across articles that this is you know, what logic is doing. Um, and it's, um, I guess it's, you know, you know, different than thinking of equality as just, you know, a, you know, kind of a, a, you know, you know, mirror given or something like this. There, there's something there, you know, there's a, you know, secondness or a thirdness, um, uh, and, you know, Lotze talks about this as, as well, that, uh, you, know, you know, one takes the impression and then, one, you know, one does some mathematical work of saying this is the same as something else. Um, which leads to, uh, to the next point uh, about uh, validity and, uh, you, know, you know, Darwin and evolution and, uh, you know, versus Plato. Um, this is, so I, I've been working lately on, you um, Husserl's 1912 lectures at Göttingen, where he was working through Lotze. Um, and uh, Lotze, he, Husserl credits for this magnificent, wonderful, beautiful way of reading Plato, uh, which is we're going to take the Platonic ideas and call them uh, validity. And he said the problem for Plato was um, they didn't have this Greek word validity. And so he's illustrating it using you know, metaphors and myths and so on. Um, but the idea is, and back to the you know, point about Ladd and Purse, uh, this is this, this act of saying that something is the same or it's meant to be the same. Um, and then Lotze looks at the new work of Charles Darwin. It was just a few years old by this point. And he's like, you know, look, this is what Darwin is doing. He's saying, oh, I mean the species and I mean it's evolving. And in this platonic way, that doesn't 
overturn validity. It's just, it's we're using validity to be able to do empirical work. So this is what Darwin is doing. By describing validity, he's bringing to bear these eternal logical meanings, you know, always and everywhere, you know, species are evolving for reasons, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, but that does not preclude process. Lotze says it's validity that permits the ability to even see process because you couldn't say that something that A turns into B without being able to speak of the sameness of A, without being able to speak of the sameness of B, and then being able to speak of the sameness of the relation. Um, so, um, sure. So, you, you, you look at at person, he's you know in, in, you know immersed in these kind of you know geological categories, and you know you know apparently the geologists were on to evolution before Darwin is. Um, so person's you know person's you know you know deeply immersed in um, you know in, in the evolutionary aspects of the world. Um, now I would just say if if we pay attention to the to Husserl's thinking over time. Uh, and to the development of Husserl of, of ideas one to ideas two, ideas three, to the Cartesian meditations. In his later work, you really see this evolutionary move. Um, but it's, you know, this evolutionary move that's still going to remain always connected with the necessity of having, you know, validity and sameness because you won't be able to notice or, or to be able to understand what the process of the community is, of inquiry is doing without understanding this role of, of the, the validity of sameness. Uh, now there's a flavor difference I'd say between, you know, person Husserl, which is, you know, Husserl just, you know, isn't reading the scientific articles in the way that, you know, Charles Peirce is doing it. Um, Charles Peirce, I think is, you know, far more cognizant early on, um, of the need to model philosophy on the kinds of communities of inquiry you find in the scientific world. Um, but back to the lab book that you, you know, mentioned, um, I think there's, you know, there, there's, you know, there's, you know, just kind of one of these, you know, uh, you know, library points, you know, purse, you know, really sabotages his career in part by doing things like publishing books with Christine Ladd Franklin. He's not writing, you know, the monograph. Uh, where he explains everything. So he's saying, oh, wait, this is not the way philosophy works. We have to contribute these different perspectives. Uh, and then Husserl does the same thing. Uh, so, you know, nowadays, unfortunately, we pull Husserl's books out of this and, you know, we publish them as monographs. Uh, but Husserl was copying Peirce that uh, with his Jahrbuch, uh, we're going to contribute all these different things together, you know, Adit Stein uh, and, and, you know, Roman Ingarden and so forth and so on. Uh, and phenomenology is going to be this process uh, of understanding. And then, if I may, you know, briefly insult the Husserl archives in Cologne. Uh, you know, now working on uh, the ideas where they pull out Edith Stein's editing. Like this is absurd. This is, um, you know, precisely the kind of monographical thinking that 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 Husserl himself was avoiding, uh, because he saw phenomenology as this uh, developmental community. Um, so I, I'd say, yeah, that you, I mean, you, that evolution is really there built into the way that Husserl himself is, is seeing and describing the project, the way that he himself is revising it, the way he's bringing students into it, uh, the way that the phenomenologists were assigning topics. Uh, they were going to do it as a scientific community, like Peirce was doing it as a, as a scientific community. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, if Claudia has some comments, otherwise, no. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Very happy. Okay, perfect. So we are at the end of our two hours and mm -hmm. also at the end of our seminars. But as Professor Fabricasi told us, we hope to see uh, the next year. And of course, we can keep in touch uh, with our mailing list. and. Thank you again to Professor Bell and for the uh, very interesting uh, discussion. So thank you all for attending this series of seminars. And bye -bye. Thank you very much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Thank you again. Goodbye.
Oh, and feel free, everybody, to, to write me a note if there's anything else you want to talk about. My email is in, address is in the, uh, the the paper I sent around. So happy for more comments. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.